Pastor John here, inviting you to join my wife Denise and myself as we plunge into the depths of God's Word, growing ever closer to Him. I pray that He gives us all eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Now join us in our service already in progress. God bless you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Welcome back to the channel. <laughs> Hallelujah. So glad that you could join us today. Open with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10. We will be reading verse 16. Matthew 10, 16. Check, 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 check. That's a little better. Mike was a little bit too hot. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Father God, we come before you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, I humble myself in your presence, Lord. You said you're in your word that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may give you grace in due season. Father, I humble myself in your presence. Holy Spirit, I am not capable of delivering this message without you, without your presence, without your power, without your anointing. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to breathe life upon this word, Anoint these lips of clay and allow me to speak your words and your words alone. Let your fire and your anointing be upon me as I bring your word, I pray. Give us all eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. And we give you all of the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. So, Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, I want to take a minute. Every chance I get to harp on this, I'm going to do it. Obviously, Jesus wasn't telling you to literally be as smart as a snake because that is pretty dumb. Because a snake's not a very smart animal. So, we have to look at what he meant behind that word. Just like there's two other places where he talks about serpents in the Bible that are getting twisted out of proportion. The word in the Greek that he used here for ser serpent is ophis. And it means through the idea of sharpness, of vision. A snake figuratively. A type of sly cunning. An artful, malicious person, especially Satan. There are two other places that he uses this word. In Matthew 23, 33, he refers to the scribes and the Pharisees as serpents and vipers. Literally, they were not snakes, figuratively speaking. How many of you have ever heard somebody say that guy is a snake in the grass? Literally, he's not a snake. The next place that he uses it, actually there's three other places that he uses it, not two. Um, in Luke 10, 19, he says, Behold, I give you power, that is authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That puts it into context. He is not talking about going out and stomping on a snake's head. He is talking about handling a demonic spirit. Are you with me? Amen. Mark 16, verse 18, he says, They shall take up serpents. There are churches up in the Appalachians that they have baskets. I guess, I'm, I'm assuming they have baskets, but they have rattlesnakes in them. And they'll sit up here in the pulpit and they'll hold a rattlesnake right by their head while they're preaching. A lot of people have died doing that. He was not talking about picking up a snake, folks. He's talking about the enemy. 
He's talking about handling a deceitful person or a demonic spirit. Amen. So what does it mean then to be wise as a serpent? What does it mean to be wise as a serpent? Number one, it means to know the devil's strategies. It means to know the devil's strategy. Somewhere between 475 and 221 BC, Sun Tzu wrote the book, The Art of War. And he talks about knowing your enemy. This is what he had to say. Know your enemy and yourself. In a hundred battles, you will never be in peril. When you are ignorant of the enemy but know yourself, your chances of winning or losing are equal. If you are ignorant of both your enemy and yourself, you are certain to be in peril in every battle. So we have to know our enemy. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2.10, To whom if ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, I, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, I read two verses. I could have made my point with the one verse about his devices. But I said that about unforgiveness. I read that part. Because that is one of Satan's biggest tools against us, is unforgiveness. You ever heard somebody say, if you're not, you're being mad at that person, you're not hurting anybody but yourself? That is the truth. It's, it doesn't do a thing to me. It puts you in bondage to be able, for the devil to be able to have permission to torment you. When you're, when you're angry at somebody... You might as well forgive them because all you're doing is opening up a door for the enemy to come and torment you. And Paul says he doesn't want that to happen because he's not ignorant of his devices. Now, here's something interesting. That word device in the Greek is noema. And it means the intellect, mind, or thought. Be wise as a serpent. Number two. It means to use the letter of the law to our advantage. The letter of law, what law? The letter of this law here, this book, the Bible. Use the Bible to our advantage. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy uses this book to his advantage. Because he is a legalist. The devil is a legalist, and it, he will either twist the word of God to get what he wants it to say, or he will use it where he knows there is a loophole. He even did this to Jesus. Really? Yes, he did. In Mark 5, 7, Jesus was entering into the, the gatherings where he met the demoniac. And in verse 7 it says, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Do you know what that word adjure means? That is a legal term. If you go to court, you sit in front of a jury and a judge. That word jury comes out of adjure. There's also another uh, word that we get from that, which is adjudication, which is the prosecution of the law. Now, that word in the Greek is korkizo, and it means to put to an oath, to make swear so solemnly and join to charge. In other words, this devil just commanded Jesus by God not to torment him. Because he knew he had some kind of a legal right there. I'm going to show you something else. Um, the devil, when he tempted Jesus, you go read the fourth chapter of Matthew, and, and uh, the devil tempts Jesus. And Matthew 4, 6, we're not going to go there, but Matthew 4, 6, he quoted Psalms 91, 11, and 12 to Jesus to try to get him to do something foolish. And Jesus fired back at him with the word of God, and he wasn't going to do it, basically. He wasn't going to tempt God. 
Number three, what does it mean to be wise as a serpent? It means to use the law of the land to our advantage. Now, we can use the law of God to our advantage. We can use the law of the land to our advantage. How, how do we use the law of the land? Well, in the 21st chapter of the book of Acts, Paul has been taken prisoner in Jerusalem because of his faith. And... In the 22nd chapter, they're trying to figure out what's going on, and the captain tells the centurion to bind him with thongs and beat him. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna examine him by scourging. It says, this is where they take the cat of nine tails. Now, the Jewish law and custom was to beat them 40 stripes, less one, just in case they miscounted because if they gave them 42 it might kill them so they would give them 39 strikes paul was no stranger to the whipping post he says in second corinthians what is it second corinthians 11 24 he tells that he had been beaten five times 40 strikes save one by the jews that's 195 licks with a cat and nine tails, folks. 195. Who, who's ever seen the Rocky movies? <laughs> Rocky II. <II. coughs> He's trying to get a job. And he wants to get an office job. And the guy at the employment agency can't find anything for him. And he finally says, he says, why don't you go back to boxing? He goes, I understand you're very talented. And Rocky says, uh, Have you ever gotten hit 500 times in the face in one night? It starts to sting after a minute. <laughs> okay. This is Paul right here. Paul don't want to get beat again. He's been beaten 195 stripes across his back already. He doesn't want another one. He already knows what it's about. And the Romans were not as kind as the Jews. They might just beat you to death. So what does Paul do? Paul was a Jew, and he was a proud Jew. He had a good heritage. And he talked about it a lot in the books. That he was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. He lived the strictest life of a Jew. But here's what, all of a sudden, he's a Roman citizen. <laughs> so in... Acts 25, excuse me, Acts 22, verse 25, it says, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? He just avoided getting beat. Hmm. Because he was wise as a serpent. You know, Jesus talked about the guy, he says, Oh, look, they're taking away the, 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 the trust from me. I can't go and beg, and I don't know how to dig. He, he said, I'll get all my Lord's people together, and if they owe 100, I'll tell them to write 50. If they owe 50, I'll tell them to write 25. And, and the judge, that Lord, command, commended that man for his wisdom because he was wise as a serpent. Paul was being wise as a serpent and using the letter of the law of the land to his advantage. Now, you know, he was a Jew, but in his birthplace, his birthplace, he was a Roman citizen. Another time Paul used to his advantage is in Acts 25. Festus tries to get Paul to go down to Jerusalem to be tried. I want you to know, if Paul had gone to Jerusalem, he would have been killed there. Now, God had already told Paul that you're going to go before kings and rulers on my behalf. Paul knew this. Paul could have gone to Jerusalem. But also, Paul didn't want to be delivered into their hands either. And he used the law of the land again. In Acts 25.10, it says, Then Paul, or excuse me, Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong as thou very well knowest. 
So use the laws of this land to your advantage when you can. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't let the world just mow you down and roll over top of you. If you have a legal leg to stand, whether it's with the Word of God or whether it's with the laws of this land, use it to your advantage. Amen? Amen. Now, we talked about knowing your enemy. So how can I know my enemy? How do I know my enemy? What do I do to know my enemy? Number one, know God's Word. Everything that we know about Satan, most of everything that we know about Satan, can be found between the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation. Everything you need to know about the devil is right here in this book. So you need to get to know the devil by getting to know this book. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the devil knows this book backwards and forwards. Like I said, he's a legalist and he will use this word when he can and where he can to his advantage. <clears throat> now, Isaiah 28, 9. He says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make understand doctrine? To them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. Paul talks about this. Everyone that... Uh, uses milk as unskillful in the Word of God. Paul talked to the Corinthians and he said, he said, I can't give you milk. I can't give you meat. He said, you want meat, but I still have to give you milk. But then there's also a place he talks about desiring the sincere milk of the gospel. we got to have the whole counsel of God. And in verse 10, Isaiah says, for precept <laughs> must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We have to have the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. New believers, read the New Testament. I would say read the New Testament 15, maybe 20 times. Start off the first time in the book of John. Then go back and read from Matthew through to Revelation. And do it over and over and over. And when you get a basic understanding of the New Testament, start reading the Old Testament. But go and read some from the Old and go back and read some from the New. Every day. you got to do this every day. I think I had, I think I had written, read the uh, New Testament probably 40 or 50 times before I ever started on the Old Testament. But here's the deal, folks. We've got to have the whole counsel of God, the old and the new. We had a saying in seminary, the Old Testament is folded, uh, excuse me, the New Testament is folded up inside of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is unfolded in the New Testament. Because, you know, when you think about it, the apostles, they did not have the advantage of having the New Testament. They got all of their stuff they got from the Old Testament. And they wrote the New Testament. So, we need the whole counsel of God. And in Acts 20, I love this, Acts 20, verse 27, this is Paul talking to uh, people in a certain town. And he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. We've got to have the whole counsel of God, the old and the new together. Number two, by prayerfully and purposefully doing research. Go look up articles on the internet, on Google. Do Google searches, not Google. <laughs> Do Google searches. But you need to approach it prayerfully. Because I'm going to tell you something. When you start studying cults and the occult, you will be vexed by the devil while you're doing it. But me, me myself, I was always like... <sighs> Man, I felt like I couldn't breathe when I was studying this stuff. I would anoint myself with oil and I would put worship music on. I had a cassette player back then. That's how long ago this was. And I would play it until it stopped and flip it over and play the other side. While I was doing my studies, that's how I had to do it. And then when I'd get done, I'd go and I'd pray some more and get into the Word. But we have to know. I, especially if you're in a deliverance ministry, you got to really you got to know what uh, 
people that do witchcraft are up to and things like that. And you know, a lot of people wouldn't know it, but a lot of witches go to churches, especially churches that do deliverance. Oh. How do I know? Because I've, well, not me personally, but because people that trained me had witches that came through our ministry. And they talked to them. They admitted it. This is after they got saved. What they do, why do they go there? Because they know people get set free of demonic spirits. And they go there as a chalice. So they're like, hey, I'm an open vessel. If you come right over here, you get here, and I'll take you home with me. Get set free from one person, go home with somebody else that's there for that purpose. So the devil don't want you to know these things. And he will vex you when you do that. So I want to I want to show you one little thing in the Bible where it talks about vexing. And um, 2 Peter 2 7. This is talking about Lot. He lived uh, outside of Sodom and Gomorrah or right there at Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says, 2 Peter 2 7, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And it's interesting because he uses two words for vexed here. Two separate words. Two different meanings. Folks, when, when there's people around you, how, how many of you have ever been at a job where people come in on Monday morning and brag about what they did and who they did it with over the weekend? That is vexing to people like us. You know, we don't want to hear that garbage. But yet we get we get around it and we hear it. You know, we try to walk away from it when we can. But nevertheless, we get vexed with it. Now, the first time he says vexed, he used the word kataponeo. And it means to labor down. That is to wear down with toil. To harass, oppress, to vex. That's somebody that's just being annoying. But then the second time he used that word vex, he used the word basanizo. And that word means to torture, pain, toil, torment, toss, vex. I'll tell you, the times when I've had to study this stuff, I was tormented while I did it. And, you know, when I was in school, I was so happy to be done with that subject. You know, and if you do study, I'm going to tell you something. I love the Star Wars movies, but here's a little hint here, folks. is Star Wars, all of it, is steeped in Eastern religion and New Age religion. It really is. And you would only know that if you studied this stuff. So, why am I saying that? Because people in Hollywood are involved in things like that and they try to put stuff in their movies you know <laughs> to brag on their thing whatever you know there was one time i was studying for a message and this witch was talking about something i'm, I'm not going to go into what she was talking about but she said i am so happy that my fellow witches in hollywood are putting these things into movies so, I mean, you don't have to watch something like Harry Potter to pick up something, to see something that's steeped in Eastern religion or the occult. And they do it very tactfully, like a serpent who slithers in the grass that you don't see till he's right up on you. Be wise as serpents, folks. Be, be careful about the stuff you're putting into yourself. And number three, by asking God to reveal them. You know the book of James says, If any man be lacking in wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men freely and upbraideth not. Every morning we say a war prayer. prayer. <laughs> yeah. Let me try to say that three times. Every morning we say a warfare prayer. And one of the first things that we do in this warfare prayer is ask God to show us Satan's tactics in advance. Why? I'm going to show you a scripture here. Proverbs 117 says, Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Hmm. 
So you got to be a special kind of stupid to see the trap being laid before you and then just walk into it. I mean, but I've done it, and I'm sure you have too. I've said I've had God say, "Don't, no, nope, don't, don't, don't go there. Don't look at that. Don't talk to that person." And I'm like, "Oh no, I'll be okay." And then, next thing I know, I'm down on my knee with a scraped knee, boo boo, crying to God, kiss it and make it better. Yeah. <laughs> You tell me you haven't been there, because I think every one of us have. So ask God to show you the devices of the enemy. He'll make you wise as a serpent, Amen. if you ask him. Now, in closing, I want to say that we have to know ourselves. So how do we know ourselves? Remember, uh, Sun Tzu, or Zhu Sun, whatever his name was, Art of War, he said, you have to know your enemy, and you have to know yourself. How do you know yourself? Number one, by taking spiritual inventory. You know, we're real quick to say, oh, I'll never fall. Peter, Jesus tells him, everybody's going to forsake me tonight. Peter says, not me, Lord. <laughs> no. No. Everybody else is going to forsake you and run away, but not me. I'm ready to go to prison and die with you. And I could just see Jesus putting his hand on his shoulder. Peter, I love you, but you're not going to make it through the night without denying me. Before the cock crows, you're going to have denied me three times. And it's probably right after that or right before it, but Jesus says to him in Luke 22, 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You know, I think it's really interesting. He said, when thou art converted. Well, I thought Jesus, Peter was already a, a, a disciple. He was already an apostle. Why did he say when you're converted? Because Jesus knew that Peter was about to fall flat on his face. He tried to show him and warn him. But Peter, no, I got this under control, Jesus. I got this. Because he did not be honest with himself. He was not honest with himself. He did not take spiritual inventory. Number two, watch and pray. And this is what Jesus told Peter. Matthew 26, 41. He said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He told him. And he, but what did Peter do? Peter fell asleep. Mm. He didn't stay awake. That word watch means to stay awake. Stay awake and pray. But Peter was too busy sleeping. And lastly, remember that you are dirt. Huh? What? I'm dirt. Yes, you're dirt. Um, Psalms 103.13 It says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. He remembers that we're dust, but we forget it. We forget just exactly what we are. You know, the, the Bible says that he... What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. But thou crownest his head with glory, and put him over the work of thy hand. All this, right? But the point is, he made him a little lower than the angels. That means we can't fight a devil on our own power. Because we are no match for them. And we forget sometimes in these mortal bodies... We think we're all that in a bag of chips, and you know we're think we're you know Billy Jack spiritually, and we're not. And this one night back in 2014 at a prayer meeting, 
I threw down the gauntlet and I declared all out war on Satan. That night, 2.50 in the morning, I was attacked by a lunatic. Now, I was able to subdue him and everything, but I dislocated my shoulder. I ended up in the hospital. I know that was an attack from the enemy, right? At, I mean, the same day that I declared war. But guess what? That one blew up in the devil's face because I took that four months that I was out of work and I got to the closest probably that I've ever been in my life during that time. And yeah, the devil probably wished he hadn't have sent that attack on me. So, remember that you're dust. God remembers your dust, but we need to remember it too. We need to remember we're just this far from falling. You know, people that live paycheck to paycheck, that's like us spiritually. We're just one sin from a fall flat on our face, folks. That's the conclusion of my message, and I want to I want to give an invitation here this afternoon. If you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, or maybe you have and you've slipped away. Maybe you're trying to find yourself. Today is your day. You're never farther away from God than one single prayer. I'm going to ask every head bowed, every eye closed. Pray this prayer with me today and mean it in your heart. You can pray it in your own words if you want. Father, I am a sinner. Be merciful to me. I know that my sin has separated me from you, God. And I know that it was my sin that put Jesus on that cross. I'm sorry for my sins, Lord. I'm sorry that you had to die on that cross for my sin, Jesus. I repent of my sins. I turn my back on them. And I turn to you, Lord. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me for all of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I confess that you died and rose again three days later and then after 40 days ascended to heaven and you're seated at the right hand of God. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to save my soul, come into my heart, be my Lord, be my Savior, and be my soon coming king. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer this morning, and you really meant it in your heart, God bless you and welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the family of God. You are now my brother or my sister. Hallelujah. The angels of God are having a party in heaven right now. The Bible says that the angels of God rejoice over one sinner that comes to repentance. Hallelujah. So look, if you haven't done so already, take a moment, hit the subscribe button, like the video, share it with your friends, and um, give, us a, give us a call. Give us a call or email or put something in the comments and let us know that you said that prayer today. Until next time, God bless you. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.